ever wondered how to use microtones to spice up your jazz harmonies? Totally. I thought I was the only one thinking about that. Well then, let's dive right into it. The rabbit hole goes really deep on this one. In between the lines. Today, we have something special for you. A song we composed specifically for this video series, using many of the concepts that we talked about in the past four episodes. We named the song Colorblind because we too were blind to all the harmonic colors that are possible. Because not that long ago, we also didn't know about microtonal music or tuning theory. But let's not linger on that thought for too long. Just go listen to the song so we can figure out together what the flarp is happening. First off, a disclaimer. Whenever we're using dominant 7th chords in this episode, we'll be referring to the harmonic 7th instead of the minor one. For 7 sus chords on the other hand, we use the minor 7th, because they're basically two stacked 4ths. This is an artistic choice, we just feel that the harmonic 7th smoothness fits bossa nova as a genre better. If you're unsure what the difference is, just go back to episode 2 for a quick refresher. Cool. Now, what was happening in that intro? Freddy and I were playing around with pivot notes and realized that it's possible to gently nudge chord structures off the usual diatonic or chromatic grid using higher limit O-tonal notes. The 7th, 11th and 13th overtone are approximated very well by 31-tet, so we can use their deviations from 12-tet to comma pump around. Oof, that was a lot of jargon cramped into one sentence, wasn't it? No, wait, don't close the video yet. We'll break it down for you. The note we used to pivot around with is a B natural, which is, incidentally, the dominant of the first chord of our verses, E minor. So it's a pretty classical way to release tension from the intro into the beginning of the song. The idea we had with the first three chords of a pivoting frenzy, F sharp minor 11, F sharp autonal, and F7 sharp 11, is that the B is an 11th in all of them, just a different shade. The Shad 11 is an overtone that conveniently sits right between the 11 and the sharp 11 in 31 tet, so the root note can simply move downwards incrementally by diesis steps. This is how that sounds in isolation. substituted secondary dominant to E major 7, a resting point in which the B is simply a fifth. And we do need some rest for what's to come, a 13 limit chord in which the B is the 13th overtone, so we have a D shed autonal chord. After that we felt like we had forayed high enough into the overtone series, and it was time to resolve the tension that we built up to that point. So we began the song. The first chord is an E minor 9, and the B is its fifth. Nice. Still with us? Good on you. We wanted to start the verse with something familiar. Meo Rami, what's more familiar to a jazz cat than a 2-5-1 progression? I don't know. Three 2-5-1 progressions. <laughs> but Rami and I added a twist to them. One of our favorite ways to modulate microtonally is to use what we call the major minor trick. The idea is actually simple. Turn a major chord into a minor chord by moving the 1 and the 5 up a diesis and the 3rd down 1. The result is a chromatone difference in the 3rd. But jazz wouldn't be jazz if we didn't at least use tetrads, 4 note chords. So what about 7ths and extensions like 9ths, 11ths and 13ths? Well, just take a look at their structure. It's pretty obvious. They're all stacked thirds, man. Just move them accordingly. Alright. So what we did then was turn the tonic that the 251 leads to into a minor chord and treated it as a 2 of a new 251. That's fun, let's do that a couple of times.
Wait. Wait a minute. We're in B major now. How the fuck did that happen? That's the dominant of E. That's crazy. So we can just turn it into a dominant chord and start all over again. And voila, we had a verse. To add some interest, we substituted the 5 of the 2nd and 3rd 251 with their tritones. A very bossa thing to do. Speaking of cliches, I think we should add a unisono string line that runs in multiple octaves. That would really fit the style. Sounds good. And it should move around subchromatically with the chords. Try something out. So far so good, but we can't loop around for forever. I think we need a B part. Well, in the lyrics of the verse we are melancholically describing the past and playing E minor. Mm. How about we use the B as the dominant chord to E major now and write something about how much is possible and that there is so much more. more to it. There's always been more to awesome, let's do that. But how about we insert some glitchy microtonally voice-led chords in between the hook and the bridge in order to make the arrival in E major more impactful? How about... But there is... Awesome! I really like how the f flap overtonal chord has this ambiguous tritone subby ring to it, which builds up expectation. And it's, you know, just a very bossa thing to do. A very bossa thing to do. Awesome. What now? Let's look at the B part. In contrast to the A part, we used various microharmonic techniques in the B part, including, but not limited to, different shades of secondary, I had no idea. backdoor, and triton substituted dominance. Heavy use of subchromatic contrary motion, sometimes in conjunction with the aforementioned dominance. Generous use of overtonal modes, often used as pivots, which, as an added benefit, also makes them more playable. And lots of major minor tricks. Our favorite being that motif the violas played here. We also added a call and response between the first viola and the first cello. The D sharp and the G sharp, the major seventh and third, respectively of E. Juxtaposed with a responding phrase. Using D shed and G flap, the shed 11 and the hard 7 of A. Jeez. And lastly, to calm the microtonal tempest going on in the cellos and violas, we added a glistening, slowly ascending violin line. There is more to it. There's always been more to it. We weren't thinking about all the stuff in terms of functional harmony most of the time. Instead, we were flowing around freely and let our ears guide our compositional choices. And the nice thing is that whenever you want to find your way back to the root, you can just use either microtonal contrary motion or overtone pivots to come home. 
Still got any questions? Drop us a comment under the video. This is the last episode of this video series, so we'd like to thank the amazing Who team, especially Goran, Tam and Victor. They were a great help and so much fun to work with. Thanks a lot. Also, a big shout out to all the people that were involved in making the Colorblind video happen. The fantastic instrumentalists, the wonderful audio and film crew, and the awesome team we had on set, making sure everything worked out the way we needed it to. Thank you all so much. And we've got some great news. We'll be able to continue working with the Hamburg Open Online University next semester, in which we'll have a three-part video series for you. So definitely stay tuned for that one. In the meantime, check out our channel where we dive into other micro topics.